Hello everybody, my name is Dr. Yanni Anechka. I'm an associate professor at Duquesne University and today I wanted to show you some information on some tips in navigating in the UCSC Genome Browser. You know, how you can basically access that information, what the different tracks are, uh, how you can optimize uh, the way that you visualize the data, and also how, you know, basically looking at the all this information that there is on a particular genome and kind of having a visual of that along a chromosome, how we can help you recognize certain patterns and importance of different sequences, okay? So we're gonna start on the home page of the UCSC Genome Browser. Uh, we're gonna go to Genomes. And then, so the UCSC Genome Browser uh, it used to really focus on mammalian genomes, but since then they've gotten, you know, really expanded into different organisms. And if you go to the bottom, you can even see that there's actually a browser for uh, the SARS virus, and Ebola virus. Uh, so there's just a ton of, ton of information on there. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the human genome. Uh, one thing I like about this browser is, is the information is organized based on the phylogenetic and evolutionary relationship of the species. Uh, so if we click human, the very top, uh, we have a link to go to the human assembly. If we can actually click to view the sequences or we can download the sequences of the human, human genome. And then one thing that's really important is you know, what specific assembly that you're working with, right? So basically, when an assembly of a genome is put together, right, it's the first version. And over time, as there's more sequencing data and additional information of how those sequences should be put together in the correct order on a chromosome, maybe some gaps are filled in, yeah, new versions of that assembly are actually produced. And sometimes those, well, all the time, those coordinates of where the genes are located and all the features are located, they get updated, right? And so that's one thing that's important is when you're comparing your information or your data to maybe in a previous study or another data set, you gotta make sure that you're working off of the correct assembly version, right? So currently, the most up-to-date human assembly is HG38, and it was actually made available in 2013. So we're going to hit go. That's going to take us to the viewer, right? And so basically, the viewer or the browser is showing you a specific region of a chromosome, okay? And so um, I'm going to um, first tell you a little bit about how the window is organized, right? So at the very top, you have the name of the genome that you're on, right? So human, again, the assembly version. Uh, you have these little arrows where you can move back and forth, and then you can zoom in and out. And below that, it says the exact chromosome that you're looking at, and also the base pair position. So literally, we're, we're located on chromosome 14, and on our viewer, we're looking between the position 61,695,513 to position 61,748,258 base pair. So we're looking at a 52,746 base pair window, right? Now, you can change where you're looking by entering a position, a gene symbol, or even some sort of term like a phenotype, right? And you can search for that and then have that browser viewer show that part of a chromosome, right? And so uh, below that, we basically have a G-banding ideogram of that particular chromosome, right? And so again, all the genomic data really is organized based on the original descriptions of chromosomes and the karyotypes from G-banding and also the quadrants that were created from that G-banding. Uh, and, and, and so basically those sequences are superimposed on that, and then the actual uh, additional information on annotations, variants, um, clinical variants, um, uh, repetitive elements, conservation tracks, all that stuff is basically overlaid on those, um, those, um, those uh, coordinates or the basically sections that have been defined previously uh, from karyotyping, basically.
right? So this is a picture of that chromosome and the banding pattern. And so basically, you can notice that it's divided into quadrants that are basically defined by the banding patterns, right? And we can see that the centromere has two red triangles pointing at each other, right? So this, this particular chromosome has a short arm, the P arm, and a long arm. And then where that little red hatch mark is, is where you're actually specifically looking at the chromosome, right? And so then we go below that, and we can start seeing the actual browser. Now the browser is, is basically broken up on different tracks, right? If you highlight the track on the left, that little rectangle, it's gonna turn green, right? And you can basically see what specific track is located in that particular position, right? And it also gives you, if you hover your, uh, your, uh, your mouse over it, it's gonna tell you what data set is in that particular track that's being portrayed, right? And so, and, and if we hover over this one, it says fixed patches, right? So basically a patch is just an update to an assembly. We don't really have to worry about that. But in the very, very top row, you're gonna have basically the coordinates of that chromosome, right? So this is again telling you chromosome 14 and then the base pair positions that you're looking at. And you can basically zoom in and out. So we can, you know, we can zoom in and out of that chromosome. Now, uh, Below that, we have the um, alternate haplotypes track. Uh, now I'm gonna focus on some specific ones that are interesting, right? So if we look at this track that I just highlighted, this is the genome annotation track for the gen code version 32 data set, right? And so basically this has all the genes that have been annotated and defined, their positions defined uh, from start to end, all the exons positions have been defined the untranslated regions for those genes. Now notice that this gene occurs, you know, the, there's multiple gene annotations or what are also referred to as gene models for this gene HIF1 alpha. So HIF1 alpha is a very important uh, transcription factor that regulates the hypoxic response in cells to low levels of oxygen, right? And so you can see there's multiple ones because there's basically multiple characterized transcripts for this particular gene, right? In that gene model, you're on the very end, you have untranslated regions, and then you basically have, so those are sort of like medium weight um, rectangles, and then you have these bars, the thicker bars that represent the exons of the gene, right? And then the line connecting those bars are the introns, and there's arrows on those introns, on those lines that show the direction in which the gene is transcribed, right? So basically this HIF1 alpha is transcribed from the left to the right. It runs left to right. Uh, now the track below that I'm portraying is um, the SNP tracks from version 151. So this is showing you all the single nucleotide polymorphisms that have been described in the human genome across many populations, right? And so notice that there's, there's um, hundreds and hundreds of of variants in different individuals, different populations that are described. Most of these variants are actually non-functional and they have no phenotypic effects, right? Now the variants that are black are uh, ones that are introns and then the variants that are colored, uh, so red or green, are ones that are in exons, right? Now if we click on the actual track itself, we can figure out what the different colors mean, right? So if you click on the track, it's gonna bring you to a page that describes what's in that track, right? So it tells you where it comes from. There's a basic description of what is in the track, um, version it is, uh, and then, you know, what sort of categories and classes those different variants have. Um, and if we go down to the bottom, now we're gonna get into the, the, information on what the colors mean, right? So basically black, again, means just an intron variant. Blue means that it's an untranslated variant, untranslated region. Red means that it's a non-synonymous variant, so it's in the exon and it changes the amino acid sequence. Green means that it's a synonymous uh, variant, so basically the variant or the single nucleotide polymorphism 
is in an exon, however, it doesn't change the amino acid, so it's synonymous, right? And then also blue also uh, can mean non-coding RNA, and the red can also mean a splice site, okay? Uh, they probably should have picked different colors for those, but you know, that, that is what it is. And so if we zoom in here a little bit more, you notice that, for example, we can start seeing some patterns, right? So we can see that, okay, the SNPs variants are pretty randomly distributed. They're both in exons and introns, okay? Uh, it seems that there's more non-synonymous uh, SNPs than synonymous SNPs. Um, we can see basically the ones that are blue here those are again, I think uh, it was in, in um, let's see, what is the blue, let's just look, I actually forget what the, so if you hit control and then you move your mouse little wheel up and down, you can zoom in and out, not, not in the browser, but in your actual um, uh, web browser, right? Not, not the UCSC browser, but the web browser, right? So that's how I, I zoomed in and out. So I'm gonna zoom out real quick. Just wanna see what the blue, blue means again. So blue means either untranslated, um, untranslated, um, so a SNP in an untranslated region, so either five prime or three prime UTR, right? Untranslated part of transcript, or a non-coding RNA. Now, <coughs> if we go, so this is really interesting. So again, interesting patterns, right? If we go to this part of the gene, so the untranslated regions are the beginning and end of a transcript on either side of the coding sequence, right? Those can affect regulation and transcription, right? But if we have blue SNPs in the middle of an intron, right, and we have a uh, code that says that it can also be a, um, a uh, non-coding RNA, right? So that tends to suggest that there's an actually a non-coding RNA transcript inside of an intron, right? Now, again, this is just a potential, right? Even in the human genome, there's actually some mistakes in these different annotations, right? Now, one, one thing that I want to point out is these, you know, these uh, tracks that you see, they, you, can, you can reorder them and you can collapse them or expand them, right? So if we, for example, wanted to you know, have a better overview of the whole tracks that we're looking at, we can actually collapse this SNP track and make it um, in what's called a dense pattern, right? So basically now this is collapsing all those variants into a single bar, right? So you can now actually see how the, you know, like those non-synonymous SNPs perfectly overlap with those exons, right? And then we have, again, the untranslated region SNPs are in that untranslated region of those transcripts, right? Now, uh, we can also completely hide that track, just remove it all the way, right? If we were to click hide, it would disappear. Like, I'm going to do that. So now it's gone. Another interesting track I want to point out is this track, the conservation track. So this is basically... Um, comes from an alignment of a hundred different vertebrates, right? And it tells you, so it goes on a scale of 4.88 positive zero to negative 4.55, right? And what it basically tells you is, you know, the higher the number or the higher the, you know, the value, the more conserved that sequence is across these different vertebrates, right? If it's more conserved, it tends to be more functional, right? And you can see that by looking at the pattern across this gene, right? So we basically see that, that uh, the more conserved regions are matching up almost perfectly with the positions of the exons, right? Because exons are functional, they're gonna be more conserved across these different species. Uh, you can also see that in the untranslated regions, they, they, they typically the untranslated regions are not as as I'm gonna scan this just a little bit over so you can see a little better. The untranslated regions at the end, at the beginning, so now we're looking at the um, five prime untranslated, I'm sorry, three prime untranslated region at the end. You can see that in general, it's not as conserved, like those peak heights aren't as high as for the exons. 
Uh, but there's parts of the untranslated regions that actually are conserved. So even within the untranslated regions, they tend to be, the sequence is more conserved than introns. However, there are actually shorter sequences in those untranslated regions that are really critical for function, you know, for probably regulation and expression patterns. And therefore, you know, mutations in those areas are not tolerated very much, right? And then we can also see that uh, if we look at some of the introns, even within some of the introns, there is actually sections that are uh, quite conserved, right? Now, they're not as conserved as the exons, but let's look at this little peak right there. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit so we can you know, get a little better view. So notice there's that section right here of this intron that is more conserved than the rest of those introns, right? So introns are free to vary, right? And so this actually suggests that there's a functional sequence within that part of the intron, right? And it actually, now that I, I think about it a little bit more, if we go back to our um, SNP data set, right, that we had earlier, we, we bring it back. Um, yeah, I was going to see whether it matches that non-coding um, SNP region. It, it, it doesn't really match it very much. Um, you know, so, so I can't really explain. Again, I don't have a good explanation why that part of the intron would be conserved. However, it most likely has a, you know, unrecognized functional site. So basically, introns can have regulatory elements. Uh, they could have sites that are important for splicing and so forth, right? But if you see that in there, then you potentially could explore it a bit more to see if that sequence plays some sort of functional role, right? Now, um, the other really nice thing about this conservation track is you can also add uh, this layer, where if you we click on it, we can select which actual species we want to see in the, in the figure to get an idea of how conserved they are compared to the reference sequence that we're looking at, right? So um, in this particular case, we can see um, you know, we have species like champ, Reese's, baboon, marmoset, you know, all the way down to elephant, manatee, opossum, Tasmanian devil. We have some birds in here, peregrine falcon, ground jay, uh, parrot. We even have turtle. Uh, Extrapicalis is um, um, the frog, coelacanth, fugu, pufferfish, lamprey, all these different animals. Now, now notice that <clears throat> if we look at this, okay, we look at the exon. So basically the way each of these rows work is if the sequence is present and similar to the reference, it has a dark bar, okay? If the sequence is absent, there's a gap, or if it's very divergent, um, it's sort of like it's gray instead of dark, right? And so for example, mouse rat, you can see that the mouse has a sequence. So if we look at the mouse and rat, they have uh, similar sequences, conserved sequences for this uh, HIF1 alpha with some of the exons in the human genome, right? But the introns are not similar at all, right? They're, the introns are actually uh, uh, quite divergent, right, in the actual rat. And if we zoom out, we can see that, um, let's see, uh, potentially, they, I'm trying to see if they, if there's any evidence that they're missing an exon. Like, so some of these organisms are, are potentially going to be, you know, having different exons. So they might not have all the exons as the human does, or vice versa. The human might not have all their exons. Now, HIF1 alpha is a essential gene for cells, again, because it controls the response to low levels of oxygen, if a cell has levels of oxygen, it dies unless it compensates for it, right? So it's an extremely conserved gene. And so you can see that even out to lamprey and zebrafish, the actual exons are highly conserved with, you know, with the human, and basically all these species have uh, most of these exons. Um, interestingly, if we look at, let's see, fugu and the pufferfish, looks like are, are missing that very last exon that's in a human, and so does the lamprey, right? So again, this gives you a lot of information on the evolution of the gene and basically how conserved it is. The more conserved the gene is, the better and, and more inference you get from 
uh, basically using model organisms to study it, right? So for example, if, if in, um, you know, um, for example, if in the mouse, the gene is very divergent and it doesn't have the same exons, or a lot of the same, I mean, if it doesn't have the same exons, <laughs> it wouldn't be the same gene, right? But let's say that we have a gene that um, has a homolog in both the mouse and the human. But in the mouse, it's actually very divergent and it has, you know, it doesn't have all those exons, right? So that would potentially suggest that if you do any kind of, let's say, um, trials on, um, you know, potential drugs or therapeutics that interact with this gene, the information you get in the mouse might not be directly translatable to the human. Okay, so now um, the other thing I want to point out is just again that you can, you know, you can hide these tracks, you can add these tracks, you can collapse them, and you can also move them around. So, for example, if I want to, um, let's see, I'm going to um, uh, hide this track set, and then I am going to add uh, clinical variants. Okay, so I'm going to add clinical variants, and then I'm going to add clinical CNVs and refresh it. And then let's see, and then I want to actually also move things around. So I'm going to grab this track, the clinical variants, and I'm going to move it so it's directly under the RefSeq track, or the gene annotation track, right? And then I'm also going to do the same thing for my um, OMIM clinical variants, right? So the, I clicked on the wrong thing there. Well, am I going to move it up here, right? Uh, so let's, let's look at this a little bit more closely. So um, I don't see it. So basically the OMIM clinical variants are variants that have some sort of disease phenotype, right? Uh, these clinical variants are I'm sorry, the clinical gen CNVs are basically uh, either duplications or deletions of large regions of a chromosome that also have some sort of pathogenic disease phenotype, right? And if we um, look at them more closely, you know, we can potentially see where they're located, what part of the gene they're located in. Again, it gives us more information on what basically could be causing that particular disease phenotype. And so if we, again, if we scroll down, all of these tracks that we're looking at up here, they are, they are, in, they are, they are organized by categories, right? So there's mapping and sequencing tracks, there's genes and gene prediction tracks, there's phenotype and literature tracks, right? So that one has things like the disease alleles, disease uh, CNVs, or you know, CNVs that are associated with diseases, I should say. So again, a lot of these alleles and CNVs, they don't have a direct causal relationship, right? So it, they potentially could just be associated with it and the actual specific role they play in the phenotype is not necessarily known. In most cases, it is not known. So it's just from an association in some study, right? Messenger RNA, so it's another expression. So if we show the expression, so I'm gonna put squish, I'm gonna show the expression data for this gene See where did it go? Sometimes it's oh here we go. I'm gonna expand it. So here here's the expression data for this gene, right? So if we click on it, then we go to a figure of, of where this gene is expressed, right? So again, we have an idea of what the expression patterns are, um, and and again, there there's just a, a rich amount of information that's available for the human genome. Now if we go to a different genome, there's gonna be less tracks that you can view, right? So let's say, for example, if we go to mouse, you know, you're going to see a lot of, of course, tracks in mouse, but it's not as many as in human. Now, let's go to, how about we go to, uh, you know, maybe one that's not as well studied. So I'm going to take us to hedgehog, okay? Let's take a look at the hedgehog genome. Um, now, the hedgehog genome, let's see, it, it's been published in 2012. You know, there's only, the assembly version is two, so there's only two versions of it. Now look at how many tracks there are. So there's virtually no expression regulation tracks, just CPG islands. 
Uh, there's only one messenger RNA track. Um, there is, um, you know, no variation. Well, there's a couple of variation tracks, but nothing on SNPs. You know, again, there's not a lot of information. Most of it is just uh, gene definitions, gene annotations, right? And so basically, you know, the, the, the big um, thing is with these genomes is that, you know, the genome assemblies are actually, you know, they're not easy to do, but they're, they're actually just the first step and they are easier to get currently a genome assembly than to actually do the annotation and then get all that rich information that helps us interpret the sequence data and the actual assembly, right? And so the best information that is mapped onto these genomes is really for the human genome and some of the other, some of the model organisms like mouse, um, you know, maybe some of like some of the, the like zebrafish, things like that, Drosophila. Uh, and the other thing to remember is that, you know, again, all these different tracks, those are publicly available data sets, right? So you can download those data sets, you can, you can analyze them, you can use them in your research. I just posted a video about how you can download data in tracks from UCSC, put it into Galaxy, and then transfer it to our studio. So you should uh, definitely view that one as well uh, if you're interested in looking into doing that. And so again, I just wanted to give you an uh, overview of you know, how this UCSC Genome Browser is organized, you know, some tips how you can move things around. Uh, again, you can zoom in and out with this. You know, you can, um, you can scroll, you know, over with your, you know, with the, with the mouse. And um, if you ever kind of lose track of where you are, again, just, you know, enter a gene symbol or a gene position, and it's, or I'm sorry, chromosome position, and it's going to take you to that particular point. Okay, so again, I hope you found this useful. And um, I will, again, be posting more videos like this um, in the near future. Thank you.